Consciousness is like a window into the present edge of time. This limited point of view has implications. Whatever its ultimate nature, consciousness as it occurs in correlation with evolved brain function in human animals is necessarily constrained by natural selection. Evolution has sculpted the human experience such that we enjoy the taste of nutritious foods, the sensations and thrills of reproduction, the diminishment of thirst as its pangs are quenched with cold water. It has also contrived any number of pains and displeasures, fears and agitations to steer the will towards its own ends. Human minds were not made for their own benefit, but for the benefit of the human body. Thus, it should be no surprise that naturally crafted beings are not granted a happy career. Why should they be? Antelopes are bio-machines adapted to survive and procreate on the savanna, to consume energy in the form of grasses, to hide among their brethren in the herd, and to run fast from predators. The problem which nature has solved in the form of that species is not the problem of how to make it a happy experience being an antelope. So why should we expect that happiness would be manifest in the solution? I believe that preamble sets us up nicely for a bit of Arthur Schopenhauer. He writes, quote, Just as a brook forms no eddy, so long as it meets with no obstructions, so human nature, as well as animal, is such that we do not really notice and perceive all that goes on in accordance with our will. If we were to notice it, then the reason for this would inevitably be that it did not go according to our will, but must have met with some obstacle. On the other hand, everything that obstructs, crosses, or opposes our will, and thus everything unpleasant and painful, is felt by us immediately at once and very plainly. Just as we do not feel the health of our whole body, but only the small spot where the shoe pinches, so we do not think of all our affairs that are going on perfectly well, but only of some insignificant trifle that annoys us. On this rests the negative nature of well-being and happiness, as opposed to the positive nature of pain, a point that I have often stressed. Accordingly, I know of no greater absurdity than that of most metaphysical systems which declare evil to be something negative, whereas it is precisely that which is positive and makes itself felt. On the other hand, that which is good, in other words, all happiness and satisfaction, is negative, that is, the mere elimination of desire and the ending of pain. In agreement with this is the fact that as a rule we find pleasures far below, but pains far beyond our expectation. Whoever wants summarily to test the assertion that the pleasure in the world outweighs the pain, or at any rate that the two balance each other, should compare the feelings of an animal that is devouring another with those of that other. Unquote. Schopenhauer's pessimism is somehow beautiful to me. As I have read him for the first time, I found myself laughing out loud when a piece of prose elegantly and truthfully captures an existential terror. It is like looking into the abyss and finding in its depths a beauty in proportion to its horror. Moreover, there is sufficient material of intellectual value in Schopenhauer to more than overflow the bounds of a single episode of my podcast. So today, I will focus on the existential pessimism, as opposed to the metaphysics, though a clear boundary is not really discernible between them. I'll share a bit more before I add too much commentary. Suffice it to say that Schopenhauer's first observation is that suffering outweighs pleasure in the human condition. This seems to accord. Psychological studies demonstrate that human beings are more sensitive to bad feelings than to good. Schopenhauer called the bad things positive in that they produce a signal and a direct experience, whereas in general, good things are those which are going according to plan and thus trip no receptor and produce no direct experience of them. I can think of exceptions, but the general point holds. Here's another passage. Quote, Animals are much more satisfied than we by mere existence. The plant is wholly satisfied, man according to the degree of his dullness. Consequently, the animal's life contains less suffering, but also less pleasure than man's. This is due primarily to the fact that it remains free from care and anxiety, together with their torment on the one hand, but is also without real hope on the other. And so it does not participate in that anticipation of a joyful future through ideas, together with the delightful phantasmagoria 
that source of most of our joys and pleasures, which accompanies those ideas and is given an addition by the imagination. Consequently, in this sense, it is without hope. It is both these because its consciousness is restricted to what is intuitively perceived and so to the present moment. Thus, only in reference to objects that already exist at this moment in intuitive perception does the animal have an extremely short fear and hope, whereas man's consciousness has an intellectual horizon that embraces the whole of life and even goes beyond this. But in consequence of this, animals, when compared with us, seem to be really wise in one respect, namely in their calm and undisturbed enjoyment of the present moment. The animal is the embodiment of the present, the obvious peace of mind which it thus shares frequently puts us to shame with our often restless and dissatisfied state that comes from thoughts and cares. And even those pleasures of hope and anticipation we have just been discussing are not to be had for nothing. Thus, what a man enjoys in advance through hoping and expecting a satisfaction afterwards detracts from the actual enjoyment of this, since the thing itself then satisfies him by so much less. The animal, on the other hand, remains, remains free from such pleasure in advance, as well as all the deduction of pleasure, and therefore enjoys the real and present thing itself, whole and undiminished. In the same way, evils press on the animal merely with their own actual weight, whereas for us, they are often increased tenfold by fear and foresight." Unquote. Here Schopenhauer establishes the idea that a burden of human consciousness, which he assumes to be much greater in accordance with our intelligence than that of other animals, is our knowledge and anticipation of the future. Hope is inevitably met with disappointment, and fear adds to the misery brought about by its object. To be conscious only of the present moment is therefore an improvement. This idea is certainly supported by the traditions of meditation and asceticism practiced by Eastern contemplatives, and this cannot be lost upon Schopenhauer, as he was well studied in Buddhism and Indian philosophy, and refers to both with as much frequency as he refers to Christianity, the chief religion of Germany. I can sum up these first two passages from the following two main claims. One, human consciousness consists in a great deal more suffering than pleasure. And two, human conscious experience is made yet worse than in other animals by knowledge of the future. Okay, let's have another passage developing this thesis. Quote, if the, if the result of the foregoing remarks is that the enhanced power of knowledge renders the life of man more woebegone than that of the animal, we can reduce this to the universal law and thereby obtain a much wider view. In itself, knowledge is always painless. Pain concerns the will alone and consists in checking hindering or thwarting this, yet an additional requirement is that this checking be accompanied by knowledge. Thus, just as light illuminates space only when objects exist to reflect it, just as a tone requires resonance, and sound generally becomes audible at a distance only through waves of the vibrating air that break on hard bodies, so that its effect is surprisingly feeble on isolated mountaintops, and a song in the open produces little effect, so also in the same way must the checking of the will in order to be felt as pain, be accompanied by knowledge which in itself, however, is a stranger to all pain." Unquote. The idea here is that, the knowledge is, is that knowledge is necessarily objective, while the will is subjective. Knowledge which stands in the way of the will is experienced as pain. So, by way of example, if it is a matter of fact that a certain man has died, this can be known as an objective fact. But if that knowledge goes along with a powerful wanting for this man not to be dead, then it is felt as grief. This proposition makes me wonder if mental displeasures, agitations, and anxieties are improved by discovering their causes, as we might attempt through psychotherapy. And if so, doesn't that imply that knowledge can be a provider of both pleasure and suffering, in accordance with the direction of the will? If a piece of knowledge is of benefit to the will rather than an obstruction to it, is this not a source for pleasure? In what follows, Schopenhauer extends our burden to include both knowledge of the future and knowledge of the past. He writes, quote, Life presents itself as a continual deception, in small matters as well as in great. If it is promised, it does not keep its word, unless to show how little desirable the desired object was. Hence we are deluded now by hope, now by what was hoped for. If it has given, it did so in order to take. The enchantment of distance shows us paradises that vanish like optical illusions when we have allowed ourselves to be fooled by them. Accordingly, happiness lies always in the future or else in the past, and the present may be compared to a small dark cloud driven by the wind over the sunny plain. In front of and behind the cloud, everything is bright, 
only it itself always casts a shadow. Consequently, the present is always inadequate, but the future is uncertain and the past irrecoverable." Unquote. According to Schopenhauer, knowledge itself is neither good nor bad. It has no valence. In combination with the will, however, the past, by being secured in its outcome and meaning, is free to be pleasant, like an Eden long ago lost. It can compare with great favor to the current situation, which is unsecure by its very nature. Something bad may be about to happen now, so the full context of the moment is not yet certain. If it turns out well, then it is permitted to take on the quality of having been a good experience, but reflecting upon the good, which is no longer, is at best a bittersweet exercise. It casts a shadow over the present moment. We have the sickening sense that we didn't know what good we had when we were there, a longing to reach back and assure our former selves that it was okay to relax and enjoy a time in our life which was a high point. Since this is futile, we are left in a state of heartbrokenness over a love lost, a broken smile of remembrance, nostalgia. We may now sum up the thesis with three main points. One, human consciousness consists in a great deal more suffering than pleasure. Two, human conscious experience is made yet worse than in other animals by knowledge of the future. And three, we only ever experience the present moment, but pleasure is withheld in the future and in the past, always out of reach. The following paragraph suggests that Schopenhauer prescribes a kind of humane allowance for the sins and failures of others on the grounds that they, like us, are suffering. He writes, quote, The correct standard for judging any man is to remember that he is really a being who should not exist at all, but is atoning for his existence through many different forms of suffering and through death. What can we expect from such a being? We atone for our birth first by living and secondly by dying. This is also allegorized by original sin. Accordingly, we have to regulate our claims on the society of this world. Whoever keeps firmly to this point of view might call the social impulse a pernicious tendency. In fact, the conviction that the world and thus also man is something that really ought not to be is calculated to fill us with forbearance toward one another. For what can we expect for beings in such a predicament? In fact, from this point of view, it might occur to us that the really proper address between one man and another should be, instead of Sir, Mansour, and so on, my fellow sufferer. However strange this may sound, it accords with the facts. Put the other man in the most correct light and reminds us of that most necessary thing, tolerance, patience, forbearance, and love of one's neighbor, which everyone needs and each of us therefore owes to another. Unquote. A call to humanism, and even Christian living, it would seem. Is it not the central lesson of Christianity that to follow the example of Jesus is to bear your cross well, with love and forgiveness even directed toward those evils which have placed that cross upon you? Life is suffering, sure enough, but it is transcended by love. Well, that's the claim. In any case, the introduction of dutiful, even stoic character has been made. Notice that here Schopenhauer has moved from an is to an ought, the assumption is that what is more pleasurable is what ought to be, in the moral sense. Existence is filled with misery and thus ought not be. But since there is existence, we ought to have empathy for those who share it with us. I'll note a degree of contradiction that this latter piece adds. I have felt love and generosity from others, and I have loved and given generously as well. Those moments really are uplifting and pleasurable. Thus we can give one another the gift of goodness, a smile, a shared joke, a compliment, a helping hand. It's like a hug reaching across phenomenal space and making contact between two coexisting beings. It says, you are not alone, you are my brother. Perhaps this realization of what actually feels good, as opposed to what we spend so much time seeking after, this is an antidote to pessimism. I'll share one more passage, which I think does a good job of expressing Schopenhauer's thesis. He writes, quote, We feel pain, but not painlessness care, but not freedom from care, fear, but not safety and security. We feel the desire as we feel hunger and thirst, but as soon as it has been satisfied, it is like the mouthful of food which has been taken and which ceases to exist for our feelings the moment it is swallowed. We painfully feel the loss of pleasures and enjoyments as soon as they fail to appear, but when pain cease, even after being present for a long time, their absence is not directly felt, but at most they are thought of intentionally by means of reflection. For only pain and want can be felt positively, and therefore they proclaim themselves. Well-being, on the contrary, is merely negative. 
Therefore, we do not become conscious of the three greatest blessings of life as such, namely health, youth, and freedom, as long as we possess them, but only after we have lost them, for they too are negations. We notice that certain days of our life were happy only after they have made room for unhappy ones. In proportion as enjoyments and pleasures increase, susceptibility to them decreases. That to which we are accustomed is no longer felt as a pleasure. But in precisely this way is the susceptibility to suffering increased, for the cessation of that to which we are accustomed is felt painfully. Thus the measure of what is necessary increased through possession, and thereby the capacity to feel pain. The hours pass the more quickly, the more pleasantly they are spent, and the more slowly, the more painfully they are spent. Since pain, not pleasure, is the positive thing whose presence makes itself felt, in just the same way, we become conscious of time when we are bored, not when we are amused. Both cases prove that our existence is happiest when we perceive it least. From this, it follows that it would be better not to have it. Unquote. God damn. I already have few enough listeners, so I hope these quotes have not produced too compelling of an effect on you. Oddly, I find them humorous in the extreme. I think Schopenhauer failed to recognize what makes life bearable even worth having in the final analysis. There is something which transcends the present moment and yet gets to exist for us only given a consciousness capable of a wider scope of understanding. Only in my most egoistic mo moments do I feel such narrow immiseration as Schopenhauer reduces us to. To be sure, I recognize the truth and terrible beauty and therefore the comedy of his writing. I selected the above passages as a means to extract and demonstrate the key claims of his argument. In sum, they are one, human consciousness consists in a great deal more suffering than pleasure. Two, human conscious experience is made yet worse than in other animals by knowledge of the future. And three, we only ever experience the present moment, but pleasure is withheld in the future and in the past, always out of reach. Thus, four, we should treat one another as fellow sufferers, with compassion, forgiveness, and love. Number four, from my perspective, serves as an antidote to the first three. After all, why should we treat one another this way? Because it makes being better for the other person. Compassion, forgiveness, and love feel good in an immediate and powerful way. These are examples of what friendship feels like, what fatherhood feels like, what brotherhood feels like. Schopenhauer argued that knowledge is neither good nor bad, rather it's objective. The will is the thing to which what is known has value. He focused on how knowledge, when it thwarts the will, produces pain. But knowledge which forwards the will must, given the same line of reasoning, produce pleasure. The things which endure, those which have existed prior to the present moment, within it and beyond, such as the love we have for a dear friend, the value of these transcends the present moment. And it is obvious to me that these are the things which make life work, worth living. Concepts which have deep meaning for us are best presented in the form of narrative, sometimes personal, sometimes specific, sometimes universal. Why do you think we love stories and TV shows and movies and music? They tell us the truth with beauty and love, but it cannot be known in a single narrow moment, not one word of the screenplay or one note of the score. Thus a piece of triumphant music, a story of redemption, or heroic camaraderie cannot exist in the present moment, but necessarily exceed it. These narratives give our life meaning. Sometimes they are the key episodes of our lives and our legacies. How do we account for this? We have to broaden the scope of what it means to be, widen the temporal lens to reveal the forest in company, encompassing the trees, the sea encompassing the waves. In the opening of this essay, I said that consciousness is like a window into the present edge of time. This limited point of view has implications. Our predicament is presented well by Schopenhauer, and it really is a tough one. However, there is something else of a broader frame which enhances the meaning of conscious being. Anxiety, to me, feels like a tunneling, a narrowing of the world to the point of minutia. There is only the panicked present in all the world. When I feel better, I am open to a wider frame of space and time. Perhaps this is only conceptual, but so many of the best things are. Perhaps the illusion is that since we only experience things from the point of view of the narrow present, we are made to think that it is on the only piece of the universe which exists, and thus we are alone and suffering. Many of my close friends and mentors are long dead. Arthur Schopenhauer is, for me, a new one. 
He's made me laugh, inspired me, taught me, and made me feel fellowship. I resonate with what he has written. Even from the grave, he has reached across time and space to shake my hand, to whisper wisdom into the ear of this fellow sufferer. The irony is that I leave this little exploration in a mood of optimism. The effect of studying Schopenhauer's pessimism with an open spirit gives the lie to its thesis. Mm -hmm. 